Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Melanie Gingell. I'm a barrister. I'm patron and member of the steering committee of Peace in Kurdistan campaign. And I'm going to be chairing this meeting this evening. Thank you very, very much for joining us to at this meeting, which is going to be a report back on the 2021 Imrali delegation, Imrali peace delegation. The delegation could only visit Turkey virtually this year, of course, but we did visit and we had a series of very good meetings with a very diverse range of trade unionists, academics, elected representatives, activists and lawyers, all of whom were deeply courageous in choosing to speak to us. For as we know, speaking out in Turkey is a very, very dangerous thing to do. We have processed the vast amount of information that we gathered and arrived at various conclusions, which you can read in full in the report, which is linked uh, in the chat box uh, for this meeting today. This year, we mark the 22nd anniversary of the abduction of Abdullah Öcalan, leader of the Kurdish freedom movement. Öcalan has languished in prison throughout these 22 years, mostly in a state of aggravated solitary confinement, totally alone and with no access to the outside world. This kind of confinement is extreme and is recognized by the United Nations as amounting to torture. His conditions were worse than those endured by Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. And for a decade, he was the sole prisoner on the island and was guarded by more than a thousand troops. This shows us that it is not just the Kurdish freedom movement that considers Erjelan to be a person of utmost importance. The purpose of the delegation was, as in previous years, to try to meet with Erjelan, to call for his release, and to call for a reopening of the peace process, which was abruptly halted by the Turkish authorities in 2015. Our speakers will tell you about how that went and what we found out along the way. This meeting is hosted by the Centre for Kurdish Progress, a non-profit organization based in London. It's independent and non-partisan, inaugurated in June 2014. It provides expert opinions and debates, focusing on the issue of Kurdistan and Kurdish people in the UK, as well as internationally. As a policy forum, Kurdish Progress organizes speaker series, panel discussions and social events in order to progress the position of Kurdish people in the UK and to offer a space for debating Kurdistan's position in the world. Collaboration with the British Parliament, local and international think tanks and academic institutions frames the core of its principles of action. And indeed, in any other year, this meeting would have been held in Parliament, again, hosted by the Centre for Kurdish Progress. Um, the delegation was organised by the international initiative Freedom for Erjelan Peace in Kurdistan, which is based in Europe. Also, Freedom for Erjelan Trade Union Campaign and Peace in Kurdistan Campaign, both of which are based in London. This, after, this evening we have an hour and a half, an hour for speakers and half an hour for questions and answers at the end. I should also say that at the end of the event, we will take a photograph of the screen. So if you're happy to be in that photograph, please have your video switched on. Uh, we have four speakers this evening. Uh, all of whom, of course, were on the delegation. Um, we're going to go first to Christine Blower, Baroness Blower of Starch Green. Um, we're very um, happy that she can make it. She's extremely busy and unfortunately she, she can only be with us for um, half an hour, but we're delighted that she can be here and I'm going to move straight to her. Um, and she's going to be talking about the situation for women in Turkey, especially Kurdish women in Turkey. Um, Christine is, um, she's a former General Secretary of the National Union of Teachers. She's Vice Chair of Unite Against Fascism and also Co-Chair of the UK Trade Union Campaign Freedom for Erjelen. Um, thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much, Melanie, for that uh, that very full introduction. 
Uh, friends, I'm also, uh, like Melanie, a patron of Peace in Kurdistan, which, uh, of which I have been for very many years and pleased to be so. And I'm very pleased to join this meeting this evening, um, the speakers at which will give you a very full picture of the virtual delegation. Um, and uh, as Melanie says, I am uh, regrettably rather busy. I was only able to join for part uh, of the delegation. But one thing that the COVID pandemic has meant is that there, although there seem to be very, very many meetings, and I regret that I have to leave this one before the end. The upside, of course, is that we can meet with people from many countries without actually leaving our own homes. And that has been able to inform some of our international work perhaps even better than we have in the past. So we meet this evening in the wake of much concern about women's safety here uh, in the UK, in London, where I live. News of the abduction, abduction and murder of a, of a young woman who was just walking home has led to an outpouring of grief and rage and demands for change. And globally, as we know, women are under attack in their homes and on the streets. The numbers of women killed by partners and former partners in the UK and indeed globally is a scandal, but never really addressed in a, in a serious way. But the news uh, of the murder of Sarah Everard within days of International Women's Day has forced violence against women onto the agenda in a much more serious way than it has been, I think, for many years. And whilst the UK has signed the Istanbul Convention on uh, domestic and gender-based violence. Uh, this country has yet to ratify it. And Turkey, under whose auspices the convention was prepared, has now pulled out through an abrupt midnight presidential decree. In 2011, Erdogan announced, that the, announced the convention by saying violence against women is a human rights violation and yet the AKP regime in Turkey now perceives this convention as adverse to Turkish family values. Of course there is a battle to be had about whether the convention can lawfully be overturned by presidential decree but the intention from Erdogan in seeking to do that is clear. So let me now move to what the delegation heard directly from women in Turkey and from Kurdish women movement in, in February this year. The struggle of the women's movement is, uh, is a particular of particular concern uh, in, in Turkey. Uh, as the TJA, the free women's movement uh, denounced in their report, we are currently, they say, going through a period of multi-layered and multi-dimensional vicious cycle of violence imposed on us as Kurdish women, waging both a gender struggle and a struggle for our identity as Kurds. With the consolidation of the conditions of fascism after 2015, all kinds of rights and social change transformation achievements gained through women's struggle have been targeted by the state. So you can see that the situation in Turkey for women is very serious. The TJA report draws attention in particular to the fact that targeting women's organizations has had a profound effect on women's struggle. The shutdown and ban and uh, illegalization of mechanisms that women could turn to in the event of violence, violence whether they had been empowered left women vulnerable to various types of violence, domestic violence in particular. And of course, there has been uh, a wave of, uh, of reaction to this. The ruthless repression of women comes in the aftermath of the breakdown of the peace process. The movement, the movement for the freedom of women had made significant advances, but as the TJA explained during the delegation, during the peace process, the women's movement were leading this. Uh, we have all been defending peace. Uh, peace councils were formed and women's council were formed during the peace process. The co-president system, which is a, uh, a significant feature, was a significant uh, achievement. And as probably all of you on this call know, the, the co-president system guaranteed equal participation of women 
in leadership posts. So the removal of democratically elected mayors across the Kurdish region and their replacement by government appointed uh, trustees uh, has had a significant backlash effect on women. Everything that had happened, says the TGE, TJA, which was positive for women, has been turned into a negative. Women's institutions were targeted, peace academics were targeted, and the system, and we heard this on several occasions, the system of isolation that started in Imrali has now engulfed uh, the whole country. So there is a very very serious situation for women, both in terms of domestic, but also other types of violence, but also that, that women are feeling increasingly isolated, other, as are other types of political activists. So it is absolutely incumbent upon us, as we, as women struggling for equality and against violence in this country, it's incumbent upon us also to make that same claim that same struggle for women in Turkey, Kurdish women in particular, but all women uh, in Turkey. And so friends, it is indeed a, uh, a struggle of political organizations, but it's a struggle of political organizations globally. And as an international struggle, it, it really is important that we raise our voices and in fact, I'm going simply to conclude by quoting something from Your Freedom and Mine, Abdullah Öcalan, The Kurdish Question in Erdogan's Turkey, uh, edited by, uh, by Tom Miley, who was, of course, on the delegation, and Fre Federico Venturini. Uh, and Janet Beale's um, uh, contribution to this book says that when we asked what we can do to help the Kurdish movement, a group of women told us, our struggle is insufficient without support from outside. We cannot raise our own voices in Turkey because when we do, we are attacked, tortured or killed. So raise our voices in your countries. Babies are being murdered in mother's hands, grandfather's bodies in the streets with no accountability. We ask you to urge your countries to hear our voices and to find a way to stop this. Your countries that prefer to side with economic interests, get them to take human rights considerations seriously. So my final remark is this. Um, I asked Lloyd Russell Moyle, who is an MP, and therefore who probably gets better access to ministers uh, than I do in the Lords. Uh, I asked him, uh, and as Esther Schmidt had also asked him, to write to the British government about the situation for Abdullah Öcalan. And we did today get a response from the UK government, from a minister in the UK government, um, who, who says all of the right things. She says that we obviously urge Turkey to ensure that they uphold all of their responsibilities in terms of anyone who is imprisoned. And clearly, as Melanie said in opening, it cannot be right that Öcalan is still imprisoned under the prevailing circumstances, 22 years uh, since he was first abducted. So now that we have that response from the British government, it's important that many more of us in Britain write to our MPs to say, this is what the British government is saying. What will you now do to make sure that the things that they say should happen are things that the British government puts pressure, uh, sorry, that Britons put pressure on the British government to actually make happen. Uh, of course, we say that more in hope than expectation. But I conclude my remarks by saying I, I recommit myself to working for and with and on behalf of all women in Turkey and working with the Kurdish struggle in Turkey to ensure that we have at the earliest possible opportunity a, a, an outcome which is a fair and just outcome for Abdul Öcalan and for all of the people of Turkey who really want to make sure that there is peace and justice and fairness in their country. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Christine. That was that was great. Um, and it's good to hear that um, we are making some inroads, at least into the British government, and they're having to make some statements. And yes, let's all um, take that up and write to our MPs um, and emphasize that. Um, I'm sorry that you have to go, but thank you. Um, next, we have um, Rosa Sally. Rosa is at this moment a candidate for the Scottish National Party in the upcoming Scottish elections. So thank you very much, Rosa, for taking time out of your campaign to come and, and do this meeting. We appreciate it. Rosa is also a human rights activist. She is Kurdish. She was born in southern Kurdistan and she was a refugee seeking asylum in Scotland in 2001. And she co-founded the famous Glasgow Girls, which was a campaign group to stop UK border agencies carrying out dawn raids and detaining and deporting children. Um, so Rosa now is gonna join us and she's gonna talk about the situation for elected representatives in Turkey. I mean, that's primarily for Kurdish people, the, eight, the HDP, but not entirely. Uh, Rosa, are you there? I can't see you. Thanks, yeah. Melanie. Um, thanks, thanks for that. Thank I'm you. here. Um, I would like to first, before I, I say thanks to all the delegation um, who took part in um, this year's delegation and to show solidarity to the Kurdish people who are still struggling as we report back of, on the situation. Uh, Turkey has a long history, as we know, of banning uh, political activities, people speaking for democracy, and through our delegation we found, you know, this is no different. Um, and really the recent attack um, we've just seen from HDP MP Omar Farouk, um, who is in the elected position, um, who's just been basically told that he have to go to prison. This is just a recent um, HDP person and uh, MP. Um, this is not surprising for the Kurdish community or activists, to be honest with you. And his official like crime is basically for tweeting um, for peace. And he's a human rights campaigner, like many of us. Um, that we campaign for democracy and human rights, but the Kurdish people have been censored in Turkey for many, many years. Um, even uh, today, myself, an activist throughout Europe, when we uh, publish about Ojalan or anything to do with um, his movement, we get censored. I personally have been censored for, uh, through Facebook and I think that is, it's a crime against human rights and democracy. And um, really the constant attack, um, it's against HDP are political genocide. Uh, there's no freedom of speech and whoever speaks against Erdogan and his government will be jailed. And that is made clear. Um, when people say, oh, Turkey's democracy is under threat, no, there is no democracy in Turkey. Thousands of party members right now, leaders, MPs and mayors are in prison as we speak. Really, HDP is the third uh, largest party in Turkey. And uh, many of them have been imprisoned. These people have been elected to represent millions of voters in Turkey. These are elected members we are talking about. The ruthless policies um, against uh, really politicians, journalists, uh, through our delegation, we found out it's really unacceptable. And in the community, um, international community, we need to really take action and try to, to raise awareness, public awareness about the situation. Um, this ongoing war against HDP, um, personally, I think it's, it's broke out when they broke the 10% threshold. 
And in 2015 general election, the People's Democratic Party won 11.7% of the national vote. And in 2018, um, they won 11 point, sorry, that was in 2018. And they also um, elected 65 local municipalities. So the, really it shows that, you know, the will of the people are SGP and they want to be represented. Uh, and we see uh, Turkey's attacking elected representative and refusing really to distinguish between the PKK and a democratically elected People's Democratic Party. And, you know, we, through our delegation, we found out, you know, Human Rights Watch have been observing what's going on down there and they, 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 they do know what's happening. And the, the imprisonment of MPs is just getting worse at the moment. Basically, whoever, whoever get elected are imprisoned. Um, the EU must use what influence it has over Ankara immediately. This is an ethnic cleansing of the Kurdish people uh, by political means. And really, the Turkish government um, are labeling every Kurds as terrorist, opposition as terrorist, organization as terrorist, po politician as terrorist, civilians as terrorists, women as terrorists, young people as terrorists. So how, everybody is a terrorist. This is the reality of people in Turkey. We see the co-chair of Salahaddin Demirtas and Figen remain in prison. And really the European, uh, the European Court of Human Rights have ruled that, you know, this arrest, uh, basically he needs to be freed. And this has been dismissed by the government as mean, meaningless. Like, the European Court of Human Rights has asked for Demirtar to be released and Turkey is doing nothing about it. it. It makes me really angry because there is no human rights and Turkey is not respecting. And this is an insult really to human rights um, in, in, in Turkey and in the Middle East. I think what's going on, the Turkish state is afraid of Ojalan's ideas on the Kurdish people, uh, on Kur uh, Turkish people, and in the Middle East. Um, they want to um, isolate his ideas and freedom for, of expression. Um, the isolation of Ojalan is, is used as a method to silence all Kurds, all oppositions. And really, I think that's why it's so important because for the freedom of Ojalan, because if he's freed, then, then the, the Kurdish people is freed. The idea of the ideas of Ojalan are, I think, are very powerful, and the culture principle um, implemented to achieve equality. I think it's a great idea which is being used by the HDP, and really having a reserved position for uh, a woman. Um, it's very radical for the Middle East. Um, and we don't even have that <laughs> over here. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very important for women to be freed and coexist. Um, and I think the democratic confederalism of self-organization and participation um, um, next to a, a nation state, is, it's, it's very important. And I think Turkey is afraid of this idea Turkey refuses any democratic solution, which is the only way forward to end violence and conflict. I, I think the, the, the silence of the international community has not helped in any way. Germany is being in the um, very pro Erdogan stance uh, in the Council of Europe and um, also the UK and the US, and I think because they are developed capitalist countries, uh, they take pro-Turkey stands, and really they care about economic interests than human rights. Um, 
And I think we need to put pressure on these countries um, because Turkey cares about trades and we need to really do that and uh, to put pressure on Turkey. Um, and the international community need to support oppositions to bring about democracy uh, in, in Turkey. Um, really the democratic public at, um, sorry, uh, I think the important thing is we ask for HDP elected representative to be released because they are the hope for a peaceful solution to the Kurdish question. And there's no question about that. And I believe um, the twinning of representative in this country and Turkey is very important. Um, so we, they campaign for their release and they support for their freedom. And the trade union uh, movement, making sure that they get involved in grassroots involvement and campaigning uh, um, to show solidarity. I mean, tomorrow from Scotland, we're trying to organize an SMP group where people, uh, the MPs in Scotland, um, to show solidarity for, uh, to the situation, what's happening in Turkey. And I think that's important. We need to put pressure on all politicians to make sure they, they sign early day motions, they speak in parliament, um, and we write to them, what, you are my elected member, what are you doing about this situation in Turkey? And I think as, uh, as a civilians, as, as the, the public in the UK, we have to put pressure on our elected representative to speak um, about the Kurdish uh, situation in Turkey and the violation of human rights in Turkey. So really, I just want to come to an end and I hope that um, you have questions at the end so I can answer them. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Rosa. Thank you. Um, we're going to move next to um, Claire Baker. Uh, Claire has worked in the trade union movement for 20 years. She's been involved in education and equality programs um, in the pre predecessor unions of, of UNITE. She now works in the international department of UNITE and coordinates the union's work with the global and European trade union federations in public services, construction, food and drink and agricultural sectors. She also coordinated the work of the Transatlantic Trade Union Workers Uniting, uh, that UNITE is part of with United Steel Workers of the USA and Canada and the miners of Mexico. She works on a number of uh, union solidarity campaign, campaigns, including on Colombia and Palestine. And she is secretary to the trade union campaign, Freedom for Erzurum. Um, over to you, Claire. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melanie. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, as with previous Imrali delegations, we were honoured uh, to meet with some fantastic organisation and I'm sure that we'll all agree that uh, we truly appreciate the time that they gave us, especially in the face of the repression and attacks that they constantly live under um, in Turkey at the moment. Um, the delegation was privileged to meet with KESK, the Public Service Trade Union Federation, um, who spent some time with us highlighting the situation facing independent trade unionists in Turkey. Uh, now, Turkey, as you know, has got a long history of coups and military rule, which has led to civil, uh, civil society existing under intense pressure um, from a state that views any independent organisations as a threat. And any free civil society that's been allowed to develop, such as trade unions, has been subject to huge assault from the government. Um, this repression intensified massively following the failed coup against Erdogan government in uh, 2016. The situation that faces the trade unions, that face Erdogan, that face the Kurds in Turkey are all intrinsically linked. Erdogan is attacking all progressive forces in the country. The war on Kurds has extended to a war on all who oppose him and stand up for human and worker rights in the country. Um, in the recent ITUC Global Rights Index, Turkey sits in the top 10 of the worst countries um, for workers. And Kess reported to us that trade union members and human rights defenders continue to face <clears throat> serious problems in Turkey. 
These problems include judicial harassment, as in the case of arrest and detentions, as well as court cases against trade unionists. Um, and the current uh, oppressive political uh, situation, along with the deficient Turkish legal system, allows private sector employees, employers, sorry, to sack workers for union activity uh, to pay compensation instead of reinstating those workers that they unfairly dismiss. Uh, employers in Turkey frequently fire union uh, worker leaders en masse once they become aware of the workers' unions' organising efforts to basically create an environment of fear and intimidation in that workplace and crush the workers' efforts to organise a union. And this is most prevalent in situations where the workers are attempting to organise within the independent trade union federations in Turkey, such as DISC and KESK which don't have links to the ruling AKP party. The compensation which uh, employers frequently pay in lieu of reinstatement can basically be factored into companies as merely a cost of doing business in Turkey. The option to pay compensation um, also puts Turkey in a position of not conforming to its obligations under the ILO conventions 87 and 98. And in the public sector, which KESK operates in, they may not be subject to this compensation regime, but their members face arrest and jail every time that they speak out against government policy, against the AKP party, or even just speaking out for peace. Real independent trade unions, such as KESK and DISC, have found it extremely difficult to function and organise. Pro-government unions, uh, which collaborate with the employers to undermine free collective bargaining, such as in Hakish and the majority, but not all, of Turkish, have been supported in their attempts to replace real trade unions. So independent trade unions have displayed real bravery by continue to, continuing to defend workers' rights and campaign for peace. And the reports given to the Emirati delegation this year show that unions are continuing to face repression, violence and intimidation. And some examples of this include um, that hundreds and thousands of people have been dismissed from their jobs or imprisoned without any due process on the basis of flimsy evidence and with no free or fair trials, um, with figures of around 200,000 fired from work in the last four years. Um, the killing of over 100 union members when a trade union peace demonstration was bombed in 2015. Uh, Renault workers and uni union officials handed suspended prison sentence for union activity in 2016 at the Renault car plant in Turkey. Their crime was to demonstrate for the right to organise and for the reinstatement of uh, sacked trade unionists. Um, the murder of trade union leaders, including uh, Abdullah Karasan, who was murdered in 2018 while visiting a Goodyear factory in Turkey. And at the Istanbul uh, airport construction site, workers went on strike protesting uh, against fatalities um, and indecent working conditions. Um, the state used military police uh, with excessive force against them and six, some 600 workers were violently arrested. 35 of those workers, including the president of the construction section of DISC, uh, were sent to prison. And following day, the days after that strike action, around 3,000 workers were dismissed. Those workers are now unemployed and blacklisted, so they can't find any new jobs. And then three years ago, 14 production workers at Cargill, that's a food production company, uh, were dismissed while trying to organise a union. Um, those workers are still trying to fight for their jobs. While the company itself blames economic reasons for the jobs, they have actually hired new workers to replace those that they have dismissed. Now, Cargill is a large multinational with sites across the globe. Opportunistic way that is using the current repressive situation in Turkey to union bust. Um, Azu Kera, uh, Kera, I'm sorry for my pronunciation. Segelu, I think, a medical doctor and president of both the Turkish um, Trade Union DISC and the Union of Health Workers, was arrested and charged with provoking people to be rancorous and hostile following some comments that she made um, at a CHP public debate. And at the trial, the prosecution also added insulting the president to the charges against her. So what we're seeing here is with this erosion of democracy, rights and the rule of law in Turkey, means that defending workers' rights uh, comes with extraordinary risks for trade unionists. 
And in fact, many of the trade unionists that we'll deal with in Unite and other unions that might be on this call today, um, know that many of those people are under investigation by the state and will likely face trial. The trade union representative that the delegation spoke to highlighted a recurring theme that we heard throughout the delegation, that the international organisations such as the CPT have not done enough or taken a sufficient stance against human rights violations in Turkey. The pro Erdogan stance of many countries was highlighted of the European Union, especially of Germany, of the UK, and also of the US. And what that means in terms of addressing human rights situation in Turkey. Decisions to support the rights and freedoms of Kurds, trade unionists, journalists, women, teachers aren't taken, or decisions to actively oppose the expansionist and aggressive foreign policy of Turkey are also not taken. So the economic interests of their relationship with Turkey takes precedent over this. The EU, the UK government and the international community as a whole are basically blackmailed by Erdogan with high numbers of refugees that are in Turkey from the Syrian co conflict, as well as the geopolitical position that Turkey holds in the Middle East. Where the EU may be quick to act on abuses of human and worker rights, say in Myanmar and in Belarus, where there is a less geopolitical or economic complication, their reaction to similar situations in Turkey is much more muted. In the UK itself, the government in its desperation for a trade deal at any cost has led it to make a deal with Turkey without any demands on worker, civil or human rights. And this shows us how little regard they themselves hold these rights in. And a reason why the trade union movement in the UK must speak out against the deal. As I said, the agreement contains no enforceable commitments for Turkey to respect labour rights. And this will mean it is not possible to use the UK-Turkey agreement to stop the government of Turkey abusing the rights of unions and workers and committing widespread human rights abuses. The UK-TUC, uh, which is the Trade Union Federation, with uh, DISC and KES federations in Turkey, have called for the suspension of the deal until Turkey respects those fundamental human and worker rights. The commitment contained within the agreement that both parties will seek to commence a review of the agreement within two years with the aim of expanding it with no or very little scrutiny is also of great concern to workers in both countries as likely it will drive down workers condition, conditions both in the UK and in Turkey as well as for the Kurdish community in the UK as the fear is that a closer working with Turkey could possibly mean an expansion of Turkey's war against the Kurds into the UK. And as Rosa uh, commented on earlier, the delegation meetings and with KESK as well showed that Turkey will link any organization that opposes um, the AKP party or does not fall into their ultra nationalistic policies with terrorism. These organizations are criminalized and banned we're seeing this happen, as Rosa was saying, with the HDP and all Kurdish organisations right now. And then we're also seeing it seep into wider civil society, including into the trade union movement. This argument to accuse any opposing group of terrorism gives governments like that in the UK, who economically want to trade with Turkey, or who want Turkey to keep the refugees off their shores, or want to military align with uh, Turkey in the region, an excuse to hide behind when challenged over Turkey's human and worker rights abuses. So we see the HDP linked to terrorism. We see independent trade unions, women organizations, human rights groups who speak out in favor of peace or against the policies of the government linked to terrorism. And companies take their cue from the governments of which their businesses are situated in. In Turkey, we can see that pitting one group of people against the other is widespread, obviously most prevalent with uh, the Kurds, and companies take their cue from that. As we are frequently seeing now, independent trade unions are busted by yellow, which is basically uh, company or government aligned unions. Um, those that try to organize are sacked or arrested. Those that go on strike are sacked or arrested. Yet no multinational is preventing the persecution of trade unions and trade unionists from taking place in Turkey. They are, in fact, opportunistically using it to their own advantage. 
Um, the policy of uh, security and war are sadly vote winners in Turkey. And along with the ongoing economic crisis, which the pandemic has only increased in severity, there is poverty, a lot of unemployment, uh, which the government obviously covers up with violence, populism and nationalism and with war. And sadly, this is a method of a control that we are seeing spread into our own countries and into the UK especially. And we in the UK trade union movement need to play our part in uh, challenging this wherever we see it, as we know where it leads, especially for the working class. Moving forward, the delegation concluded that solidarity among trade unions needs to be extended internationally. As a movement, we need to be stronger in expressing solidarity and speaking against the Turkish sta uh, state's attacks on workers, civil and human rights, including that of Erdogan. Because as I said at the start, the uh, situation that faces the trade unions, that face Erdogan and that face the Kurds in Turkey are all intrinsically linked. Progressive forces in the country are under attack, the war on the Kurds and the isolation of Erdogan and his ideas has extended to a war and isolation on all those who oppose him and stand up for human and worker rights in the country. We cannot campaign for the human rights of Kurds without two campaigning for the rights of trade unions, campaigning for free civil society in the country and campaigning for Erdogan's freedom. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. That was, that was brilliant, very comprehensive. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're going to move now to our final speaker, who is Ogmunde Yonisen from Iceland. He started as a journalist, a TV journalist, um, editor of foreign news at Icelandic State TV, um, then became a trade unionist. Um, he was on the executive board of Nordic European International Trade Union Organizations, including the Public Services International. He was then a member of the Icelandic Parliament and was Minister of Health, Minister of Justice and Minister of Interior in the Icelandic government in the period 2009 to 13. He then became chairman of the Constitutional and Supervisory Committee of the Parliament of Iceland and at present He's a member of the European Commission Against Race and Intolerance and Honorary Associate of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. He's also on the advisory board of the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy in Berlin. And most of his working life, he's been a part-time lecturer in history at the University of Iceland. And he is also a prolific writer and commentator. Uh, he's spokesperson for the International Initiative Freedom for Abdullah Öcalan, Peace in Kurdistan. And <clears throat> he has led um, two of the international peace delegations to Imrali. Um, so over to you now, Omendu. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me in this uh, conference. Uh, as we have, you, we, we all have heard from uh, my colleagues, uh, the situation in terms of human rights in Turkey is getting worse. And we were told that uh, in Turkish prisons, there were signs of increased brutality. And as somebody said, the Turkish prisons are overflowing with people demanding democracy. Uh, there is spreading a new hunger strikes strike uh, well into its third month and we have had news that Leila Guven who started the hunger strike in 2018-19 she has been arrested again and is behind the bars now what we were trying to understand uh, who took part in this Imrali delegation was whether the situation was getting worse or if it was not changing. Now the evaluation of our interlocutors was that it was getting worse, it was, it was deteriorating and they described the regime as a regime of impunity. Now what does that mean? 
what does it mean to be a regime of impunity? It means that whatever you do has no consequences. You can do whatever you like without any consequences. And we learned that exactly this was happening both domestically and internationally. And I would say a few words about it. Now, domestically, we have heard that the trade unionists are being imprisoned. They can't travel abroad if they are critical of the government. There is, uh, there is, uh, there, there have been uh, uh, imprisonment of uh, of uh, academics, of lawyers, of judges, of journalists. Uh, members of the board of of uh, of uh, newspapers which dare to criticize the government they are being charged with uh, terrorism and lawyers who are defending their clients they are being charged and imprisoned for doing exactly this for defending their clients and this in a state which claims to be constitutional based on the rule of law, which, of course, it is not. So, domestically, this is, uh, this is uh, evident that there are no consequences for, the, uh, for breaches of human rights in Turkey. And if we turn to the international scene, we'll take a few examples there. Now, uh, Rosa Sali mentioned uh, Dimitras that uh, he and the other co-chair have been in prison since 2016. In 2020, in December 2020, the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, said, came to the conclusion that Dimitras should be released. And as Rosa said, the Turkish authorities reacted by saying that this was of no relevance. Why? He's a terrorist. Now, people have been looking very much at uh, the Council of Europe and its institutions, and in particular, the so-called CPT uh, committee, which is a committee which is meant to oversee that there is no torture in the prisons of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. Now, there has been criticism over the years that the CPT has not been pressurizing uh, Turkish authorities or not even asking for visiting uh, Imrali Island or other, uh, other uh, prisons in, in Turkey. In view of the fact that uh, since the break up of the peace talks in 2015, there have practically been no links with Imrali. There were signs of life in September 2016, and then nothing at all, no sign of life, no connection until May 2019. This was after the CPT committee visited uh, Imrali. And why did it visit Imrali? I'm sure it was due to the hunger strike initiated by Leila Gouven in November, I think it was 2018, and then it went on until that time. And then they gave in. And then there was also uh, international pressure, which reminds us how important international pressure is. But after that, the lawyers of, uh, of uh, Özalan were allowed a few visits, a few visits until August 2019, and then stopped. The CPT uh, committee published its report which then was republished or, 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 or confirmed by other, other institutions within the Council of Europe in August 2020. In that report, it said that immediately Turkish authorities should overhaul its detention system in Imrali and in other prisons where there were such isolation policies. Immediately, this should be resumed. Immediately, 
uh, he should be allowed to uh, uh, to to have meetings with his lawyers. They should be allowed to uh, visit him, and regularly there should be monthly. I think they said there should be a report on such uh, visits. What was the response? The response was to make the isolation even deeper, deeper. They cut off all connection with Imrali after that report, all connections. The, the only connections that were uh, last uh, year, they were twice, the last a telephone call in uh, late April last year, and then nothing. And this is why it happens, as in the last few days, when there were rumors that Ursulan might be seriously ill, even dead, there was no way of confirming this. No way of com confirming this, which tells us how dangerous it is, apart from the breach of human rights, how dangerous it is uh, to have such lack of uh, transparency. Now, the, the, the CPT uh, committee visited Turkey last January, this January. I made no attempt to, to uh, visit uh, Imrali Island, or, or nothing is, is known of such an attempt being made. I know word about it. And then it also happened, and this we were told again and again, that the president of the Court of Human Rights actually visited uh, Turkey, went to the University of Istanbul, where many academics had been imprisoned, to have a medal on his jacket. And then he visited Mardin in southeast uh, Turkey to have discussions with the trustees that had been put by the Erdogan government in place of democratically elected, uh, elected uh, 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 mayors. Now, I, I, I mentioned one more or two more examples of uh, international silence or complicity. Uh, in 2016, or after the assault on the Kurds started in uh, 2015, the city of Sur, the city of Sur, the, the city which had been declared a United States, a United uh, Nations uh, uh, World Heritage. Three fourths, 75% of that city, of that ancient city, with, 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 which had survived thousands of years, was leveled to the ground, was destroyed. United Nations Heritage. Have we heard many words, many much criticism from those institutions which are meant to uh, defend human rights and culture? No. So this is another example of complicity. And the last example I want to mention is when the assault was being planned and uh, just before it was started in, in, the, in the summer of 2015 against the Kurds, an emergency meeting was called in Brussels. This is where the, uh, the Turkish government asked for it, to get a green light from NATO before the uh, assault. Jens Stoltenberg, the general secretary of uh, NATO, came out after that meeting and said, we are all united. We are all in complete solidarity with the Turkish government fighting terrorism. And this was done in our name. In my name, Iceland is member of NATO. And uh, this is another uh, example of a regime of impunity at home and abroad. And I think it is absolutely terrible to be witness of this. Now, uh, to, uh, to uh, finish with, I want to say a few words about uh, the imprisonment of 
of uh, Ursula. Uh, I, I think it is, I, th I think, and everybody thinks it is. Everybody we spoke to, and I begin, begin to understand this myself, that his imprisonment is the imprisonment of Turkey. It's the imprisonment of the Kurds, and it's an imprisonment of freedom. And when you look or read the words that came out of Imrali prison, that moment the window to his prison cell was opened in May 2011, we will understand that uh, those who, who imprisoned those words do not have a good conscience. Because what he was asking for was peace. He was asking for peace, but not only peace, a dignified peace. And this was very much in line with what Leila Guiven told us, who visited her at her bedside in 2019. She said, I am not committing suicide. This is not an act of suicide. It's an act of love for life, a love for dignified life. Thank you. Thank you very much, I wonder. That was um, a very good roundup of everything. Um, we now have half an hour, if anybody would like to ask questions. I know we have one in the chat already. Um, and we have somebody, no. Let's look at the one in the chat first. Okay, there's a question from Facebook. I think um, we can direct this to everybody. Um, it says, what is your opinion on the closure or the threatened closure of the HDP? Can one assume that the Turkish state will not leave a door open to Erdogan's projects? So um, a general question on what, what are the prospects for the HDP um, in the coming months? Does anybody want to answer that? Rosa? It's a hard question, to be honest with you. Um, I think really for the HDP, we have to put pressure on our own politician. That's my view for the, for their free for their freedom because they have there is no democracy in Turkey um, and whoever speaks uh, within HDP or elected members they are imprisoned. Um, and the only way to pressure Turkey for freedom and to uh, really, I think it's um, it's very dangerous that what the road is taking, Turkey is taking. Um, the, the, the road path that Turkey is taking is actually uh, putting Turkey in crisis because HDP is, uh, speaks for millions of people. Um, and if you are going to shut down a political party, there will be anger and violence. Um, and really, I think uh, Turkey should rethink about their decision. Uh, and us as activists in, in the UK and around the world, we have to put pressure that Turkey uh, respects um elected members um that's kind of uh i don't know if i've uh answered the question but it is very difficult what we can do yeah um Obunda, do you have any comments do you see how do you see this um turkish state strategy towards um democratic representation for the kurds in turkey now well, my feeling is that on the, for joining the conference are many people who know much more about this than I do. You know, when it comes to uh, Turkish politics, to HDP, uh, 
you know, the, the, the position of the HTP. But what one came to understand that there was a correlation between the, 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 the success of the HTP democratically in, in, in elections and the way Erdogan decides in 2015, in the spring of 2015, to turn against them, to try to polarize society, to try to polarize society. Whether this is happening now, again, I simply do not know. But I, I think it is interesting. I think it is terrible, but interesting and something to think about. And probably other people can, uh, can uh, comment on this that Turkey should now withdraw from the convention of, uh, of the Istanbul Convention on the rights of, of, of women. That, I ask myself, why is he doing this? Is this, is this an, an act of trying to polarize again, you know, to, to appeal to, to extreme groups in, in society? I don't know. I think there are others here uh, on the panel and, and uh, at our conference who will be better to 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 answer this than i than i am any other comments claire um I'd, in, in regards to the hdp i mean you know it's it is an attempt really to as rosa and Ogmunda have said you know it's a, an an attempt to annihilate the Kurdish political voice and just another step by Turkey to to remove Kurds from from Turkey. Um, and as Rosa said earlier, you know, ethnically cleansing in a political way, you know, they, they've they've repressed them in their culture, repressed their language. You know, they're attacking them on on the land that they live in, the attacks on on the Kurdish cities like Chisra. Um, and over the border into Rojava as well. Um, this is this is the, the Turkish state um, threatening, intimidating, and imposing its its will over the Kurdish people in every possible way, including their history as well. You know the destruction of archaeological sites. So every part of um, Kurdish culture is being attacked here. But you know we have to remember that in the past uh, Turkey has banned political parties. And they come, they they reform in other in under other names, and um, if they do ban the HDP, which looks likely, um, th those those voters who voted for the HDP and the people who are active within the HDP won't be going away. Um, so they'll they'll reform under a different name and you know start again and build and build again. And obviously, you know, we of will be there to support them. Yes. I think what must be what must happen is, you know, we must uh, or or I'm look I'm looking at with a mirror at myself and uh, us who live outside uh, Turkey, we should of course uh, direct our words our criticism against our governments, our part of the world. Uh, I I attended. Uh, the, the People's Tribunal in, uh, in Paris, uh, the Permanent People's Tribunal on Turkey and the Kurds, this was in 2018, where they uh, mapped out what happened uh, during the, this horror period from 2015 till, to, till the end of 2017, where serious war crimes were being committed. Without a word, without a word from the NATO countries who, on whose behalf Jens Stoltenberg uh, expressed solidarity with the Turkish government. And I think we must somehow, as we were told in Diyarbakir when I was there in 2018, I think it was, then there was a, a young man, an activist in, the, in, in some human rights organization who had been sacked from his job. He said very proudly, don't worry about us. We will survive. We will find a way of surviving. But will you? How are you going to 
save the the honor of 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 your own countries who are staying silent and being complicit in what is happening so what i am urging us to do who are living outside uh, uh, turkey who are member of members of whether it be the european union members of the council of europe members from nato where i don't want to be at all i must admit but we are still there. We should be directing our words, our criticism against our own governments for their silence, for their complicity. Can I just add something that um, currently, like there is not any separation between the government and the judiciary. The president um, really shaped the way the system actually works um, for its own supporter and interest. And that's why um, now they want to ban HDP to benefit his own party and basically removing any checks and balances. Uh, so no one can actually question him. And I think this is a really dangerous road that Turkey is, is taking its people. And he has become a dictator, really fascist. Um, and there's nothing in fascism, there's only way to go is destruction of its own self. And we have seen that democracy always wins. And um, I have seen it in my own country where I, I, I come from in, in Kurdish part in the South. You know, people used to say Saddam Hussein will never be removed. Nothing is gonna happen to him. And we saw his destruction. And Erdogan is taking the same route, I think. Okay. Yes, I remember to tell a little story when uh, when I was member of the council, uh, the parliamentary assembly of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. We met with uh, an Imrali delegation who had just returned from uh, Kurdistan. Uh, this was led by uh, the late South African judge Essa Musa. And he was reflecting on the, on the struggle in South Africa against the apartheid uh, regime. And he said, the most difficult thing in our struggle was getting people to understand what Rosa has just said now, that it is possible, that it is possible and it must be done. So they created this slogan, freedom in our lifetime. And that was a big sort of threshold to step over. And what I, what has inspired me a lot, because I have learned a lot from these uh, Imrali visits to Turkey, what has inspired me a lot are the people we have met and how courageous they are and how willing they are to keep up the banner of freedom uh, in the face of prison sentences and persecution. And I, I really salute them. Absolutely. Um, we have three questions now. Um, one from the chat and two from the audience. The one in the chat is about Erjelen and um, the continuing decision to imprison him in the circumstances in which he is. And the question is whether the panel thinks that other states are involved in this decision in some way, for example, Iran, the US, Israel, UK, or other countries. So that is one question. And then we have two from the audience as well. Um, Nej Nejdet? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? It's, um... Yeah. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the contribution. Although everybody has been taking apart for the such important event, so thank you to Ibrahim to uh, proceed all these things to enable us to come together to manage to do this and uh, combat the really main issue we are facing it today individual and communities also as an ethnic society could 
and I am the uh, also representative for the West Midlands Kurdish community. And uh, due to my location, I have to cut it short. So I'm this issue, and I'm deeply in it with a whole family. Also, I have two my brothers, Martai, due to Kurdish cause. So my father was the regional director of the Kurdish uh, Democratic Party. Recently, he's been arrested and released because of old age. So the matter is comes from the long beyond, far away beyond, is which has come 1940 when the Turkish Republic was established. So this national constitution law in Turkey, that's the agony for even the Turkish government on its own. So this is dishonesty of the national law, Turkish government and comes to the 1950s, 60s. And then with the uh, Adnan Mender, again, when he's uh, hanged by the cop again, and again, they twist the law and the military law stepped in. And this always, this circle comes to the 80s, early 80s, and again, and military law based in the place in Turkey. Turkey had two options. Option first, this honesty of the European Union government. It doesn't matter individual, the gentlemen, MPs, other MPs, yourself, we just shred ourselves, scream out. It doesn't change any fact that if the government doesn't change, take the opportunity to put the hammer on the table, say, right now, this matter has to be sorted. Now and then, the Turkish government is the country constitution is okay. based on the strong can I, strict can I, sorry to interrupt you yeah. Um, yeah. thank you very much for that um yeah. contribution um i'm sorry it's yeah. quite hard to hear you it's breaking up slightly do you have a, a question that you that you yes. want to address yes. if you'd like to when, do that quite briefly because we have a couple of others to fit in well, yeah. when and how we will push the whole European Union government, include our government, UK government, to take the serious, serious act against this. So that okay. once for all humanity, for everyone, for safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we have another well, question from Heaven. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, hello. Hi. Hi, um, thank you very much for letting me in. Um, first of all, I just would like to thank um, all your guests um, and everyone who is actually contributing to this session. Um, literally, the question which is I was going to ask the panel, it has just been taken by the gentleman before ah, me. Okay. Um, literally, I will just repeat the same, the question. I mean, uh, first of all, I'm a Kurd from Syria. Okay. And I would like to, I mean, I'm not quite optimistic, like Rosa said, that democracy always win. Unfortunately, the time has proven the opposite. And to be honest, I'm coming to the stage which is I'm losing the confidence on the democracy of the world. Um, as, as a very ordinary person raised in a very beautiful place and very safe environment, my family house was quite safe and peaceful. Um, and I have a quiet hope in, in UK. I mean, it was one of the only country which is I was always admiring and loving the democracy and everything in it. But unfortunately the time has proven everything opposite so far for me. I hope this will change, but I don't have no hope anymore. Um, but anyway, as, as the gentleman just before me said it, how and when or will we ever be able to force our government plus the United uh, Europe countries to do anything for the Kurd in the Middle East, in Kurdistan, in all four parts? Will there be any hope for the Kurd to have at least something? I mean, I'm a sort of person who was all right with being part of Syria as a country, but at least I could have just some right at least one day if I wanted to get go and take my kids to the that land and say to my children this is my home this is my land we used to have this but now we are part of Syria as a one country 
I respect that. We have no issues between the Arab and Christians and, and the Jews and, and all other nations. We Kurds were always peaceful toward everyone. Yeah. And we grew up like this from all across the part. And I can say that freely from this panel, uh, from this end, and I'm quite sure a lot of people will agree with me because um, we are like this. And b besides, we have been going through a lot of pain from those people. I mean, we suffered quite a lot from the Turk, but to still be friends with uh, Turks, we suffered a lot of pain from the Arabs, racism and, and, and everything. But to still, we find the good one and we be same. We, we take them as a friend and trust them and stand side to side next to them when they're being equalized uh, and see us as a human as well. We are, are much generous than lots of people. We okay, open our heart and our, our hand and our home to, to them. Wrap up now, if that's okay. Please. I mean, just this is my question, and I hope they will give some answer to yeah, that. Thank, thank you. you. Very, thank you very much for that. Thanks, so Alec. We have um, three questions now. The first one about um, the incarceration of Ojalan and whether um, there are there's basically a further international conspiracy in relation to that. Um, secondly, how can we push the EU and the UK and other governments to um, help the situation for help to you know, bring about a political peaceful situation for the Kurdish question? Um, who would like to, Claire, come in first? Uh, yes. Um... On the international side of it, I think, um, you know, the countries that were involved in his abduction in the first place, obviously, um, play a part in this um, and have responsibility to it. But the main thing is the complicity, complicity of the international community for not speaking out against Erdogan's isolation. It, you know, his, his imprisonment and his isolation on Imrali Island is against international and Turkish law and no international organization speaks out against it. Um, and, and across Turkey as a whole, the, 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 the international community is complicit in not speaking out against the human rights abuses that are taking place. And I, I, you know, I know that there's lots of geopolitical reasons, you know, there's countries playing, you know, US, the Russia, Iran, et cetera, all playing a role in here. Um, but on a very simple level, I always just look at it thinking you're, the international community is causing itself more issues by not dealing with the situation um, of human rights abuses, of Erdogan's isolation, of you know, civil rights abuses in Turkey, because you're seeing what Turkey's doing now. You know, it, it's, it's aggressive foreign policy in Syria, it's in um, Armenia and Azerbaijan, in, in Libya against Greece, you know, it's causing problems for the EU itself there. Um, so I, I do find it's just bizarre how the EU will not put sanctions against um, Turkey, that the UK government would not pull out of or, or suspend the trade deal with Turkey. But I think it does come down to, sadly, you know, this the blackmailing by using the refugees because the refugees flooding into Europe, you know, is is a threat to the European Union as a whole. And you know what it's like in this country. I mean, it's horrific how uh, the refugees are used. Um, so, you know, I think that they're just using Turkey and Turkey's blackmailing. Um, and he's even said Erdogan recently, hasn't he, where he said, help me annex part of, of Syria or I'll basically let the refugees go. Um, so, yeah, the, I think that there's a huge complicity with um, the international um, community. And remember as well, Imrali is basically a blueprint for Guantanamo Bay. Um, so, you know, criticizing Imrali is, you know, from the US perspective, is criticizing Guantanamo Bay. Um, uh, with Biden coming in, obviously, you know, for the Kurds, it, it's a little ray of hope. I haven't seen anything too major just yet, but it's better than that, the, the insaneness that went beforehand. Um, putting in, I think it's McGurk into Turkey by Biden. Um, he's a critic of Turkey. That's a good step. Um, I'd like to see more out of Biden, though, you know, in support of the Kurds. You know, the, the Kurdish people in northeast Syria, especially, 
had a, you know did, it was a great sacrifice in in for all humanity that they um took part in in order to stop isis to stop that um extremism spreading even further and you know it's always said that that you know they they're they are basically treated by the international community as expendable and um I think it's I think it's a horrific thing that the international community do towards them. Um, in terms of the UK government acting, I mean, you know, at the moment they've got an 80 seat majority. It's one of the most right wing governments for a very, very long time. You know, we will keep the pressure on them. We keep we've got good MPs that will hold them to account. But they are. You know, even Rob said the other day that he would make trade deals with countries that do hum have human rights abuses. So I'm not entirely, uh, I don't have a lot of um, enthusiasm for ever getting the UK government at the moment to move on this at all. Thank you for that um, very full answer. Um, any other comments on that one? Yeah, Omandia. Yes, uh, first, we don't know what's going to happen, uh, as uh, Claire said, you know, with, with the new administration in the United States. I must admit to a little prejudice I have in my heart that uh, when uh, Biden said America is back again, it uh, sent a chill through my veins. You know, I, I, I don't want them imperialist America back again, and we don't forget that those who are arrested Ursulan in 1999, where the Turks, the Turkish security forces or, or, or intelligence agency and the CIA and Mossad, they united in arresting him. So uh, I must admit to that. But uh, what Heaven Jamo said, I sympathize very much with, because also I have a I'm struggling with not uh, losing belief in democracy uh, in the world, in worldwide, you know, as it is developing now. But I will tell you how I am, I am getting my hope that uh, things might turn to the better. My hope has been provided by the Kurds. Uh, when I came to Strasbourg in 2013, uh, as a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the, of the Council, every single day there was a vigilance by the Kurds outside the Council. I knew very little about their struggle then, but I knew that this persistence every day, week after week, month after month, year after year, there must be something serious there. And then we followed what was happening in northern Syria, in Kobani, how uh, the struggle there and the models they were trying to erect gave us all hope. Uh, when I went to uh, visit Yabakir in 2014, there were municipal elections. And we saw side by side a male and a female standing for mayor, the Kurds, again, putting theories, brand new theories into practice. And then we started, or I started to read Ursalan's uh, theories and seeing how they were received by the Kurdish communities, uh, transforming a national struggle uh, of liberation into a much, much deeper democratic mold. And I think all this gives us hope. And this gives not only hope, I would think, for the Kurds, but for the entire world, that we may be moving forward on the road towards democracy. So even if I, like uh, uh, Heaven Yamo, have been struggling with this fear that uh, democracy is gone, I see this uh, I see this light ahead, and that is provided by the Kurdish struggle. So I'm getting, I, I have this optimism in my heart. 
Can I just add something? Um, I think just from that, I think Kurds uh, have shown that they are very determined people and they will not give up the fight um, that easily. And for fighting for democracy and freedom, it's a human right. Um, and I think the world will unite with us. And that is the hope of many Kurdish people um, to unite with us. Uh, let's not forget though, the colonies, the, 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 the region was colonized by the United Kingdom and the Kurdish people were divided between these countries. So I have no faith in the Tories and the UK government of really supporting, you know, they, they won't change their foreign policies in Turkey. Uh, and I think that our only hope is people in the trade union, activists, and really civilian and the public. Um, yeah, I think Turkey will use, and I think Claire, Claire uh, was very crystal clear on that, on refugees being used as blackmail by Turkey. And I think that is uh, the strongest, what they have done in Turkey to uh, state that they will, uh, let the gates uh, open and let our refugees in. And let's not forget NATO. Um, and the UK is always says, Turkey is, is our NATO ally and we can use, they use Turkey for their wars uh, in the Middle East. And they are the base that they use for uh, their main kind of, or their nuclear weapons and, uh, mass destructions and um, and I think for forward I always support people who want to disarm a uh, nuclear weapon in this country and I think that is very very important that we continue that fight with them because we don't want any uh, war weapons to be created and billions of pounds be spent on something that it kills civilians um, and children um, in the Middle East um really this is um a, a fight for humanity and we have to speak up about um uh, these crimes thank you rosa thank you for that's very good comments to end on can i just remind everybody that we would like if possible to take a photograph now of as many people as possible so please could you turn your videos on so that we can get a picture Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. It's been really, really great. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of the speakers for giving up your time this evening. Um, we will see you again next year. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.